Hi, I'm Sean Duggan, and welcome to The Fix, the podcast all about Lightroom, Photoshop, and all the cool things you can do to your images with post-processing. In this episode, we're lucky to have Photoshop expert, author, and workshop leader Stephen Burns with us to go into all the cool things you can do with 3D in Photoshop. So I'm really looking forward to talking with Stephen in this episode because learning about 3D in Photoshop is something that I really want to do. If there's one thing that I don't know about Photoshop, it is the 3D capabilities. I've dabbled with it a little bit, but it's still kind of a big unknown area. So Stephen, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for having me on, Sean. This is an honor to be here. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. So as I mentioned, you know, I have dabbled with some of the 3D tools in Photoshop. Yeah. Um, but dabbling is really about as far as I've gotten. I know some of the basic concepts. I know about the X and the Y axis and the Z axis. Right. But but that's about it. And, and you right. are uh, you know, somebody who has been working with uh, 3D in Photoshop for quite some time. Well, one thing you don't want to do is dabble in Photoshop. <laughs> or dab not in Photoshop, but dabble in 3D in Photoshop or 3D in any program. Um, 3D is very, very uh, it's sophisticated. There's, there's definitely a learning curve to it. And why is that? Because uh, as, as artists, we understand the X and the Y axis. You know, that, that's the two-dimensional world that all, all artists will work in. But now we've got this three-dimensional world in the digital media, which is that Z axis that's going in and out. And is that Z axis, that Z axis is what throws everybody off. And that's what really makes it much, the learning curve much, much higher. Because now we're not just dealing with two planes. Now we're dealing with this whole third dimension, which is going to reflect more of what the real world is. So into the 2D world, we're used to creating a perspective, for example, a perspective grid. You establish your vanishing points, you establish your perspective lines, and you build according to that perspective grid so that you can get a simulation of 3D in the 2D world. But now we're dealing with the real 3D world where now you have to learn a bunch of extra stuff in order to really make this an artistic media for you. Right, right. And, you know, it, it occurs to me that, you know, when, when artists are working with, um, you know, sort of natural media in the 3D world, like sculpture, for instance, right. you know, right. it all comes naturally because you're just whatever. You're molding the piece of clay or chipping away at the piece of rock or assembling some, you know, uh, amalgam of, of real world objects into a 3D sculpture. And we don't have to think about all of those things that you have to sort of uh, think about when you're dealing with 3D in software, such as the Z axis and perspective and the way the lighting is doing. So it, it, it really, I think that's what makes it maybe a little bit more of a, a steeper learning curve and a hurdle for, for many people who, who may already know a lot about Photoshop. Uh, it's just so different. It's such an other world. Well, in, in, in the, I will say the traditional 3D world where we're working with stone or alabaster, um, you're you're dealing with the physical object right there as as it exists. You're not dealing with code. Uh, in the in the digital world, we're not only thinking about how we would manipulate the three D object traditionally, but we also have to think about the code to make that happen. That's what's that's the huge learning curve of this whole game. Uh, Adobe has done a hell of a job in in making three D, in, in my opinion, a lot more accessible to the common guy. Adobe didn't really mean the three D to go in a direction that it is going into today. I think what they originally designed it for was to bring in third party three D objects that you build in Lightwave or ZBrush or programs like that. Uh, and those are the programs I work with mostly. It's mostly Lightwave and ZBrush. Right. And and uh, and then you can take those models and bring it into Photoshop. I believe that's what Adobe intended to do with the 3D engine. However, I'm a beta tester, and I and I beta test quite a bit the the 3D aspects of uh, of Photoshop. And I I you know I was able to show them that guess what your program can do a heck of a lot more than just bring in 3D objects from third party programs. You can actually build them. You know, mm -hmm. in Photoshop, and I'm going to show you examples uh, how how I actually um, have done that. That's going to be in my new book coming up in December. 
of this year, uh, 3D Photoshop for the creative professional. So everybody here is going to be the first to see um, imagery from that new book. Oh, cool, cool. That that sounds like exactly the book that I that I need to to help me <laughs> with the the 3D learning curve. So it's, this is uh th this is not your first Photoshop 3D book. You were, you did one for Photoshop CS5, and right. I know you have a, a DVD uh, title that you did for Photoshop Cafe uh, right. on on Photoshop CS6 3D, right? In fact, my first book was uh, Photoshop Trickery and Effects, and it was uh, Charles River Media was a publisher. Of course, today it's Cengage Publishing, and and I've written them all the way up to Photoshop CS5 Trickery and Effects. So in all of the books, I've included 3D. Um, I'm a light wave artist, so I work with I work closely with new tech and 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 utilizing light wave as a as a as a creative tool uh, for my uh, 3D outlet. Now, in all of my books, I've always included light wave 3D objects. I started where the traditional way where you bring in the 3D objects and 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 save it out as a bitmap like a JPEG or a TIFF and then bring it on into your layers in the Photoshop. Of course, that's right. all changed now. Adobe has changed that game. Where now we actually can take the real 3D object, bring it into Photoshop, spin it around, zoom in and out, change the perspective of the lens, and then place it into your composite and create reflections and create glows. It's really um, fascinating what we what we can do now. So I, I have a question just in terms of how uh, Photoshop 3D capabilities relate to uh, what you could give in, uh, what you could get in other programs such as Lightwave or ZBrush. So obviously mm -hmm. those are designed from the ground up just for 3D and I'm sure that they have uh, a wealth, you know, a lot more uh, features and functionality, but um, how does uh, you know just sort of a high-level view, a quick drive-by view? How how do the three D capabilities in Photoshop compare to some of those more dedicated three D programs? All right. So the answer to your question, honestly, it is it's still in it's still in its infancy. It is not going to be three D in Photoshop is not going to replace any of those three D programs. Um, the 3D in Photoshop is there to help complement those 3D programs to make the transition from those 3D programs into Photoshop 3D world much more seamless. That's where it's, it's getting stronger and stronger. In time, I believe Photoshop is going to start to develop stronger tools. I know I can't, I, we, no one knows where this is going to go. I'm hoping that's where it'll go. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, as, as, as a beta, beta tester, of course, I can't reveal specifics, but I think this introduction of 3D printing inside of Photoshop is phenomenal. Now, I teach over at um, Otis College of Arts and Design, and I also teach over at um, over at Golden West College. Um, both have just uh, have brand new 3D printers. We're using the Cube, both uh -huh. the smaller versions and the larger versions. I mean, and I have the opportunity to actually explore and experiment how far we can go with printing out 3D objects. So it's an exciting time to be an artist. Now, I thought it was an exciting time to be an artist when Adobe started introducing these cool features for graphics and photography, and now you got 3D, but now we can print in 3D yeah. world. Now yeah. we can take what's in here and bring it out here so we can touch and feel it. We can make our own toys. Heck, the, the toy industry is going to suffer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I was teaching. Uh, I was teaching a workshop at the Anderson Ranch Art Center in uh, near Aspen, Colorado, this summer, and they had, you know, in one of their their uh, programs there, they had, you know, designing for three D printing, and they had this room full of all the three D printers. And I would always go stop by and check out and see what people are doing yeah. on the three D printer. Yeah. <laughs> it's an, another area of Photoshop that I have I know nothing well, about, but I'm and, very very curious about. At the time of this podcast in Pasadena, it's the, it's the 3D convention. Unfortunately, I, I won't be able to make it this year, but I'm going to keep keep your eyes open for that. For anybody who's in the Southern California area, uh, I know this it's all the 3D companies and Adobe is there, and anybody who's interested in 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 the whole 3D connection, that's a convention to go to in Pasadena. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to mention here before we get into looking at some of your images and maybe having a, a, a short demo of some of the sure, 3D absolutely. capabilities is that you are the uh, the president of the San Diego Photoshop Users Group, Yes. Uh, which, as I understand it, is is one of the largest, if, if not 
the largest uh, yes, Adobe I, user group in, in the States? Yes, I run, well, technically I run two user groups. One is the, um, the San Diego Photoshop users group. It's an official Adobe user group with the largest Photoshop users group in the country. We're about 5,333 members. And we, we meet at the headquarters, the Art Institute of California in San Diego. We meet at their headquarters. We usually get about 120 people on, on regular attendance, sometimes more depending on the speaker. Bert Monroy is gonna be here in October, October 3rd. Uh, oh, great. I, that, that's, that's the day before Adobe Max. So if you're coming to Adobe Max, feel free to make a trip down to San Diego. Bert Monroy will be here as our presenter and then drive on back up to LA for Adobe Max, which is exactly what Bert and I are going to do. Cool. So after the meeting, we'll both to drive up to LA and, and, and attend the Max conference. So, um, so yeah, our user group is made up of photographers, 3D artists, digital painters, concept artists. It's, it's a very, very group. Now, I know a lot of what you guys out there see in Photoshop have a lot to do with photography. <laughs> Um, but Photoshop is, is, has, has, has gone way beyond photography now. Um, Photoshop is now bringing in, you know, comic book artists. Um, I mean, pretty much most of the comic books in the industry you see now, a lot of them are, are, are done digitally, done in Photoshop. So your digital painting is not mostly done in Painter, although Painter is a superb program, it's mostly done in Photoshop. Fine artists are using Photoshop. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a program where is extremely diverse, which I'm hoping to share some of that diversity with you all today. Cool, cool, excellent. And then the other thing I want to mention, and we'll we'll definitely put these in the show notes, is that you also uh, run the uh, Photoshop user group on Facebook. Yes, got, that uh, vibrant uh, membership base there as well. <laughs> yes, yes, about almost approximately twenty thousand members, and great, we great. have meetings, monthly meetings. So, um, Eric Scala who is a, a world-renowned concept artist and digital painter, or a traditional and digital painter, will be our speaker in October. So go to the, you know, send, just like a Photoshop users group on Facebook, you'll find it, um, you know, request to join, and we'll be happy to have you involved. Great, and as I said, we will put uh, uh, those links in the show notes so people mm -hmm. can just click on them and be, go right there. Well, excellent. Listen, uh, you have uh, some images to share I do. Uh, with us about stuff gonna, you've done in, in Photoshop and, yeah, I'm and going maybe to, a little bit of a demo. Yeah, absolutely. So I tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with everybody and you're going to be first is to see some of the results of what I'm going to include in the book. So the book is going to be something very different. Um, I, I understand that this is going to be, I will be the one of the first authors to actually do this, all right? And, and that the book is going to be accompanied with an app. And this app will go onto your uh, MacBook, your, your, your um, iPad or, I, or iPod. It will also run on your Droid devices. So basically your, your iPhones, your Droid phones, or Droid devices of, or, or, or iOS devices of any type, um, you'll be able to download the app. And while you're reading with the book, you will have physical interaction with the model, the 3D model. So, as, so the chapters are designed where you're modeling, you're texturing, you're lighting, and then of course you're rendering. And, hmm. and you get to go to the app and say, hey, I wonder what this compare your work compared to what I did as an author. And you I can see. zoom in close, look at it. And then along with the app, it's included videos. So any hmm. particular areas that I as an author felt that needed to be explained a little better, I have all quick time videos for every single chapter all through there. So wow. it's going to be a, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a cognitive, a visual, a tactile learning experience. I'm trying to, to make a connection in all the different areas that people like to learn in. No, that's excellent. So it's uh, you're really kind of uh, taking advantage of the the multimedia possibilities there to yes. expand the learning experience. Yes, and, and absolutely. So what you're seeing here, first of all, is is the chapter where I'm talking about simple modeling, just just building things, and 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 I decided to take 
something that will be used as an illustration for a wire gauge or the interior of a wire gauge. And all now everything that you're looking at here is all built natively in Photoshop. This is none of this is 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 built um, in Lightwave or ZBrush and brought in in Photoshop. All of this is built natively in Photoshop. Okay, so I'm going to go to another image and share with you. Um, simple little object that I teach you how to create. We can build 3D objects in multiple parts and pull them all together. This is another mm -hmm. example of that. Cool. Okay. Another so now these things get some simple uh, you no know, you no know, models that we can build here. And then when I'm going to show you in the demo, I'm going to show you kind of the concept of how it was done. So here's a fun little one. I decided to do a little Wacom tablet and uh, display. All of it is built natively inside of uh, Photoshop. Okay. So no no, pho no photographs are used. Right, no photographs are used, uh, you know, that it was molded from. It was basically all custom created in Photoshop. Now, you can see there's a little bit of a photograph on the monitor itself, you know, right right in here. Now, that's an image map to represent an image inside of the Wacom Cintiq Companion. All right, so here is a watch, all natively built inside of Photoshop. Okay, textured, modeled, rendered, and lit. Okay, inside of Photoshop. And another example here, the sand dunes built inside of Photoshop, the hourglass built, the sand in the hourglass built inside of Photoshop. Wow. Everything textured. That's beautiful. Ah, thank you. The only, the only photographic elements is just at the far background of the, of the sky and the clouds, but you can see the sand and all that all built natively yeah. in Photoshop. Now, that's the kind of... Um image that that I would be interested in using Photoshop 3D capability with, you know, because I like to do compositing uh, and especially creating what I call imaginary landscapes right? Um, like that. So I, I can envision myself wanting to, to create some sort of a structure that, you know, does not exist, but then I could place inside one of my landscape photographs and get it to match and everything. So that that's very intriguing for me. And, and absolutely, and uh, and and uh, oh yeah, with with the work that you do with compositing, I think it's going to really, um, you're going to love it. You're really going to love it. I love what you're doing with the compositing and some of the video and compositing. I think the 3D is going to add a lot of very interesting elements to it. So the digital world now is creating a whole new breed of artists. So those who would never pick up a paintbrush and oils will now do it in digital. Those who would never pick up a chisel to create a 3D object, we're now doing it in a 3D program. Hmm. So it's a whole new breed of artists, and this is all custom built inside of Photoshop. Yeah. The sword, the mud, um, all the texturings done inside of Photoshop, and custom in, in 3D. Another little example of a little bit more of a sophisticated 3D object. Um, of course, the chapter, each chapter, I show you how to build these objects. So each chapter is how to, how to build and render um, all these different 3D objects. This is an actual wine opener, a bottle opener in the drawer, my kitchen drawer. And I decided to go ahead and build it inside of Photoshop and then light it in such a way that it looked like studio lighting with soft boxes. We have a whole chapter in my book on lighting, on how to build soft box effects, um, how, to, how to mold lighting to get the effects that you want. Um, this is a, uh, something I did for Colin and this was for Photoshop cafe It's a DVD. Definitely is a Photoshop CC. Uh, it's 3d Photoshop CC. Definitely. Looks like a, it looks like a Star Trek phaser. That's the original Star Trek phaser, which I yeah. think is the coolest actually. And yeah. all custom built in Photoshop. Okay. Not a 3d program. So it, it, it some of the imagery here should give you an idea of the power that modeling and 3D Photoshop has. Now, I built this phaser and I and I and I put I posted a picture on the beta testing team and the product manager, one of the product managers contacted me and said, uh, "What program did you use to model the phaser?" I said, "I didn't. It was all done in Photoshop." <laughs> and I get this this comment back, "You did this in Photoshop?" You know, question mark exclamation and I said, "Yeah." He he didn't believe me. He said, "Well, send me the file." That's why I sent him the file. <laughs> <laughs> so it surprised him. So 
the programmers don't always, you know, design the, you know, the program to do certain things that artists will, will pull out later. So this is the actual cover of 3D Photoshop for the Creative Professional and the publisher is Focal Press. A great publisher, uh, wonderful people to work with. And I, I pitched my idea of creating a book with an app. They loved it. So this is the one, this is this is the one, what you're going to see on the bookshelves uh, coming up in December. This was another idea for it. Uh, most of my concept art friends told me that they preferred this one because it was much more appealing to the general market. Uh, although I preferred this one because there's a lot more action in the scene. Um, but my my concept artist friend said, who are actually professionals in the industry doing comic books and so forth, mentioned that there's too much going on, too much to track. Um, keep it simple for the cover. So I I honored their I honored their um, advice and went ahead with this one here. And I think it works all right. Okay, so another example of building. I'm going to show you something like this when we do the demo and building 3D objects in Photoshop. Another example of 3D objects in Photoshop. Um, little space scene and and meteors, as you can see. So really, it's it's amazing what what can be done uh, with the program. Other examples, um, just I'm going to kind of go through them very quickly so that we can get to the demo. Uh, utilizing other third party programs inside of the 3D Photoshop engine. Okay, so let me um, let me also just go right into Photoshop so that um, I can give you an example of, of, of the power of the program utilizing 3D. Now, 3D is basically vector information. Now, all of us um, digital artists should know that we're dealing with two types of graphic imagery. One is vector, one is raster. Raster coming from camera pixels. Vector is just dealing with algorithm, algorithms of shapes. So I'm going to make a basic shape. So I'm going to come, I'm going to go right over here and and place this right over here. And I'm going to create what I think is gonna be a vase, all right? Or a, a vase of some sort. So I'm gonna use that as my middle line because what I'm gonna use is a revolving technique to build my, my subject. Now, what uh, what tool do you are you using there to start with? I'm still so using the pen tool. And what okay. we're gonna do is we're gonna use vector shapes. So I'm gonna just right. draw this out. So let's, Put a point here, and I'm going to quickly draw out the base of the base, all right? And then what I'm doing is I'm making sure I have a shape selected here. I'm going to place another shape here. Actually, I'm going to hold my control key so I can kind of place things where I want it, okay? And then I'm going to just curve the neck out just a little bit. Open up the mouth of the base fairly wide, all right? And I'm going to make a little bit of a curve here, another little curve for the lip of the vase. And I'm just going to just kind of bring it down across because I want to open up the inside of the vase so that we can see inside. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull this on over. Okay. Go ahead and, and manipulate some of these curves. Actually, I want to put more than one. Let me go back here real quick. Okay. All right. So. Let's go, I'm going to zoom in a little close here. So I'm using the pen tool to just recreate bring it across this shape in here. There we go. Bring it on down. Oops, that was an accident. Okay. And let's put another point here. And that was an accident as well. All right, there we go. All right. So now let's go over here. I'm going to put a point here. Close it off, and there we got it. And let's go ahead and keep this a straight line and just close it up. All right, that's all we need. I can come back in here. I'm gonna manipulate this real quick and just clean it up, grabbing points. So that looks like it's just sort of half of a vase. That's right. So we're creating what would be considered half of our subject. Okay, and I'm just doing a quick little, there we are. All right, this can be modified as you like, but 
All right, so we're going to go with this here. Come down to the bottom here. I'm going to go ahead and drag this point on up just a little bit more. There we go. Let's go ahead and just take that on in. There we are. Okay, that's all we really need. So it's going to be half of a base. Let's go create. One of my 3D panels. So there are two places you're going to be working on in, in, in a regular basis. One is the 3D panel. The other one is going to be its properties. I want to go with the extrusion techniques. I'm going to create extrusion from this 3D object. It's already targeted. So I'm going to simply target create. And there's my extrusion. So I now I can take my navigational tools. I have a rotation, rotation on the Z axis, and so forth. If I click and hold, there we go, you can see... I am now working in a 3D environment with an extrusion. Now, if I have a linear extrusion right now, I'm working on a, on a, a Wacom Cintiq 22 touch screen. So I'm actually drawing and painting directly on my monitor, which I find this to be very valuable in terms of, um, of 3D working. I want to go to an option. It's my 3D panel. And what I would like to do is go to the shape itself. And I want to create, use a preset. I'm going to drop down on the preset and use what's called, what we normally call a revolve or a lathe concept. It's like lathing with, with woodworking. Mm -hmm. So target it, and there's my vase. Okay. Wow. So, again, I don't have to be really clean with the whole vector shape, but that's my basic vase. And I can modify this. Now, notice here that we have several options. And... My camera, I can actually set the focal length of my camera, you know, in millimeters. So if I want this to be more of a hundred millimeter, hit hundred, and you can see it zoom in a little bit. I uh -huh. can move the camera back by utilizing my navigational tools in the timeline. I'm going to use my slide tool, which slides it on the Z axis, in and out. Okay. Go to my rotation tool, and it's rotating the camera around. Now, if you notice, the object. Is, uh, is actually rotating along with the ground plane because we're basically simulating the camera rotating. If I just want to target the object here and rotate it, again, I can just do the object and the ground plane stays, stays where it is. Or I can come right over here to my pan option, which is going to pan it on X and Y axis. Okay. Um, Let's go over here to the rotation, which is this is what's called the roll tool, and that you're rotating on the Z axis, which is going in and out, the axis going in and out of your photograph. So red, green, and blue, X, Y, and Z. Okay. Um, all right. So now I want to modify this vase just very quickly. So the, the wanna, blue, the little blue indicator there, that's the Z axis, right? That's right. the Z axis, X, Y, and Z. Red, green, and blue, color coordination. And that's usually standard in most 3D programs. So Adobe has honored that. Okay. So I can, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little detail to this base. Say I want to add some little, little extra. I'm going to show you something really, really fun. I'm going to modify this shape. How do we accomplish that? Target the shape. Hit the edit source. Now I'm back in my source, right? What would happen if I go to my layers? There's my original layer. Let's rasterize this for giggles, all right? Let's go ahead and right-click. And what we're going to do is we're going to rasterize the layer, which now makes it pixel base or raster base, all right? So um, let me just interject something for, for those people who maybe didn't notice this, but... I noticed there when you just uh, were on the layer that the layer was a smart object. Is that something that happens when you apply the initial 3D uh, properties to it? All right, let's go backwards. I'm going to go step back. And your question is that this was not a standard raster base layer. It has a little symbol here that is not a smart object but instead a vector object. Oh, so a shape layer then. It's a shape layer. Oh, okay, yeah, the, the, the little icon there is a little bit small for me to see, so that's why I made that assumption. Right, right, right on screen. So what I did was I decided to go ahead and rasterize it to take it to a standard layer. I see. All right, 
So now, what does that mean? Let's go to my window. Let's go to Arrange. Let's go ahead and tile vertically. And I'm going to just double click on this to, to, uh, to minimize it just a little bit. And if I just hit Command S, now this is what's interesting. Because it was originally a path, it wants to stay a path. So, trans so making a transfer from a vector concept into a raster-based concept you want to stay in vector for this. So that was one of the challenges. Now watch this. I'm going to share something else. I'm going to go back. Hit the F key, go to full screen mode. We're going to go back to our layers. Just to show you the flexibility that you have in 3D here. All right. I'm going to make a new layer. I'm going to go to my brush tool. Right. Let's go ahead. I'm going to choose like a medium gray for the background. I'll make a make it a little easier to track here. I'm going to turn off my vector shape for the time being. Now let's say we actually create, we're going to draw our 3D object. Let me go ahead and I'm going to go select a, a brush, all right? That's going to be hard edge, keep it simple. And then in my brush properties, I'm going to make sure I have a nice solid, okay, that looks great. I'm going to make tighten up the spacing so I have a nice smooth edge. So I can come here all right, and do the same thing. Bring it to here. 3D, extrude, click there. See, that's the flexibility we have. Now, watch this. It's real fun stuff because now you can start to work with it like clay. Come right over so, here. So that, that option is good for, for people who are not necessarily that adept with the pen tool in yep. Photoshop. Yep. Absolutely. The pin tool, I think, gives you a cleaner result, but, you know, yeah. it's, it's getting so good with 3D now that make a nice little solid edge brush in Photoshop will be able to recognize it. Now, the beauty about this here, if you go to the 3D object, I can, I can adjust the actual thickness I'm seeing inside. I can adjust the extrusion by bringing it tighter. See how the circle in the middle closes up? Yeah. And I can close up that base there. Okay, of course it makes it a little thinner, but we have those flexibilities. Now, the reason I wanted to show you the paintbrush effect is because I can go and edit the source. Let's go back to window, arrange, just go ahead and tile vertically so we can see them side by side. I'm gonna close out this one. I don't wanna look at that right now and target my layer for my shape. So let's add a little bit of extra information here. Hit the B key for my brush, resize it a little bit, maybe add a little nodule here, add a little nodule right down here, okay. Maybe I'm going to come right up in here and go to my E key for the eraser tool, make a little solid edge, and maybe not, you know, nudge in so little rivet so i want to make sure again i'm going to take off my i want to make sure i have a solid brush to work with so if i tap down there we go a little nodule right here it's kind of get it all out here and good i, I think i can imagine what's going to happen here from from right. what you're doing here right. i'll so, i'll, I'll, I'll see if my imagination is correct <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead and hit command s boom See, yeah. <laughs> it updates automatically. So if I, come, if I come over to here, okay, to this side and rotate this around, we can see the effects. So it's hard to see. The lighting's not right. No big deal. We're going to come over to our 3D panel, target our light source. Oh, we can mess it around. There we go. Move the light nice. source around. Now we're starting to mold our pot a little bit. Say I want this to actually be the base of the pot. I want this base portion to come out a little bit more. Come back on over, hit the B key for the brush, make the brush maybe a little bit bigger and just kind of paint it on out like so and then hit command s there it is immediately <laughs> it's updated it really 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 fun stuff so nice so yeah and there you go we have your lathing command and we can actually <laughs> edit that lathing command so we can come here we can do whatever we want so uh steven this is actually really fascinating to me especially the the um the concept that I don't have to necessarily use the pen tool, although I am perfectly comfortable with the pen tool, 
Um, but the fact that I could just brush on a shape and turn that into a 3D shape Correct. Um, sounds really interesting to me because, again, as a photographer and a compositing artist, I'm not so much interested in creating entire images that are totally 3D, although I might get to that one day. I'm interested in maybe creating elements that I could use in a composite that is mostly photographic, so something right. in the background or something like that. So the ability to actually just sort of paint and extrude that to a 3D object Right. It's pretty interesting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and being able to paint and add additional paints, for example, if I wanted to take my brush and I'm, in, in, in my, I'm using my Wacom tablet once again directly on the screen, I can use fade functions to create different types of effects. So if I go to my, my shape dynamics, use fade as an option instead of pin pressure, then it's going to show you right down here what I'm going to get. So I'm using about a 25 pixel fade. So I'm going to try it. See, I'm getting something like this. I may want to go a little bit longer. So maybe I'm going to undo that one and adjust the fade to something like pixel, uh, 50 pixels and then drag it up something like so. And hmm. then hit, let's go ahead and close this down. Hit command S and boom. Okay. Now it's, 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 it's very, very cool stuff. So now we're starting to create these very interesting um, shapes. Now, if I want to turn this into a space station, let's go ahead and bring this down. And I'm also going to reduce the size of this. I'm going to, I notice how everything highlights yellow. So when I highlight in that little rectangle in the middle, I can, I can resize it down. I'm doing it for a reason. I want to turn this into a space station or, or, or some sort now. So how about if I come back over to here, command T, I'm going to squish it like that. Okay and hit command s okay all right now i want to create the outer portion of the outer rim of the space station hit the b key and then how about if i do something like uh, well i have it in fade right now so i'm gonna click this way like so maybe something like this maybe something like this and just play around with it and huh. we come back so <laughs> It's That's just, cool. It, it's, it's just a matter of using your imagination. So you that is very very cool. Yeah, I mean, you, you you see that I'm just doing stupid little squiggly shapes here, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Then I want to make like like, like I want to put windows on the inside, and make a little rip a, a, a rivet in there. So I'll go back to my let's do this. Let's do something like hit the eraser tool. There's my eraser tool. I'm going to right click on here. And I'm going to see if there's any other type of a brush that I can use. Oh, I can make custom brushes. No, we're going to keep it simple. Go to this one here, solid edge. And then just zoom in close so I can see this a little easier. And just erase away that whole section like so. In fact, I'll do this whole one up here. Okay. And I'm going to go back to my brush properties and make sure... See, my opacity is 29%. I'm going to go up to 100%. Now, there we go. Solid. That's it. Just stupid little moves like this. And hit save. And now we have this really cool little, you know, wedge in here. Hmm. And if I go over to my light source and I can adjust it where I can see that wedge a lot easier. So that's great. It's, it's very fun. Now, Another thing that we have, we have texture abilities, right? And I'm going to go ahead and close this one out. Yeah, let's go ahead and hit Command-0 to pop it to full view. And let's texture this guy here. So go to my camera. I want to zoom in with my camera. So I'll tell you what. I'm going to hit the Slide tool and just tell the camera to get closer to the 3D object. Oh, guess what? I can go to a wide-angle view. Let's go to something like 15 millimeter. All right. And there's my camera. Make sure I'm going to slide in there. And now I can get in. Look at how it distorts, right? Oh, it's, wow. That's great. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's trying to match the, the, the results, the focal length of a 15 millimeter. I'm going to decide, okay, that's too much. Let's go to 30 millimeter. That works just fine. Okay, there's my 3D object. So we want to texture these things, right? I mean, I can hit the B brush, right? And um, let's go ahead and grab a color. We can actually paint on this guy here and start to paint. So I need to adjust, make some adjustments to my brush and tell it not to fade, just turn everything off. In fact, I will use my transfer capability 
to use the pin pressure of my Wacom Cintiq companion or my or my Wacom Cintiq uh, 2026 Cintiq monitor here. So I can press light and a little harder and a little harder and a little harder, and I've got graduation of color. And I can paint on what I want. So if I want to, I'm going to go ahead and paint this all red on the outside here. I can even place in texture on here if I want to. Or I can paint on windows. So if I decide to come over to here, grab, um, let's see if we can actually hit the D key for white and fill with the foreground color, and there's a window. All right. And if I hit the the V key for move, and there's my window all stuck on there. So it's, it's endless. What's beautiful about 3D objects in Photoshop is here's my 3D object. I can name it. I can, I can call this one. We'll call it base. That's what we started with. Here are all my textures, and I have my extrusion material here. The extrusion is all, this is extruded material all on the, on the outside here. I can come over here. And Adobe's given us these material presets where we have visual presets. And I can add more if I like and scroll down here. We can see more. Let's add a brick to it, okay? And there we have brick, okay? <laughs> um, I can add other types of effects. That was, that was from the, uh, the space stations that they built in the late 1800s. That's right. There we go. We've got all types of other cool effects um, that we can apply to this. This one even has transparency map mapped on it. Um, and I can grab this one as well. So after all is said and done, I can render this. It's not rendered yet. Let's go ahead and change the light source from the side. And I'm going to go to my extrusion material and look at the bump and see if I can increase the bump map and get more. See that? I can yeah. get more texture. Increase the bump there. And we're going to render it just by placing this, pushing this button or this one, same symbol, or use the shortcut, command or control, older option, shift, all three uh, modifiers, and then hit R. And then you'll get the watch it. Um, there you go. It's now it's going to start to render. Now we're sharing through Google, so it's probably dangerous for me to render, but it looks like it's doing a pretty good job. And you can see how the shadows are accurately being rendered on the on the subject. And it's now rendering. Okay, it starts off with a little bit of a noisy image, but it starts to render it until it becomes a nice solid detail. Hitting the escape key to turn off the render. And if I want to make adjustments to the lighting, now watch this. Target the lighting. The shadow is pretty hard edge. In fact, let's bring our 3D object, the base, closer to the ground plane. Okay, it's going to touch the ground plane. Let's go to the 3D camera. Go to the the um, the, the move tool and just move up the whole ground plane. So I'm going to bring the ground plane right about here, and I'm going to just position it. Now I'm going to target my 3D object and just slide it up, go to my rotation command, and just move it around like so. So I want you to see the shadow on the, on the, on the actual floor here. I'm going to go to my light source, bring it to the side. Now, if we render now, you're going to get more of a hard edge shadow. However, I can come over to the shadow slider and soften up that shadow. You see it softening there? Yeah. Hard to soft. Now let's go do a render and see how it looks. Using the shortcut, command or control, older option, shift, all three modifiers, and then I hit R for render. There. Okay. Now you can see immediately it starts noisy. As I pointed out, it was hard to see in a 3D object because there was a lot of texture there. But on the ground plane, you can see all the noise. And then the longer you let it render, the, 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 the more it starts to smooth out and get rid of all this noise and gives you a nice beautiful render here it, ref it refines itself basically as yep. it, con it continues yep. so so what is the obviously the render time is going to depend on the complexity of the object and absolutely. how how much horsepower you have under the hood of your computer absolutely um, it, it depends on how many lights you have in the scene whether or not you're using let's go to the i'm going to stop the render by hitting escape whether we're using an environment map Right, mm -hmm. so I'm using a, a you know an, a, an image that actually lights the scene. So, for example, I can go grab. Let's see if I go and 
to replace that image with something different. Let's say these are some art images I have here. So just for the sake of, um, well, in fact, here, let's go to my desktop and we're going to go to my, there we go. We're going to grab one of mine and I'm going to grab this one of the sword and the stone. There's a lot of orange and a lot of yellow in it. Target it. See, it's mapping the image on a circular light that's surrounding the entire 3D scene. And if you look mm -hmm. at the ball, that image is actually mapped on it. Now, if I, I render see. it, and I, I, can, I, can, I can increase the intensity, see? Yeah. Or if I render it, we're going to light the scene with that 3D object. Currently, I have this light lighting object, too. Let's go ahead and turn it off by hitting the eyeball. Now it's off. Go back to my environment. You can see that only the environment map now is lighting the scene. And if I render this out, let's see what it looks like. So it depends on, and, and we're going to take notes that there may be a little bit more of a render. Now, this is not that bad. You can see the colors of the lights of the image, whereas lighting the 3D object is actually being placed in an orange or yellowish tinge. And everything's being lit equally in all directions, so the light is not directional. Right, right. All That's right. actually pretty cool. Uh, from you know, from my point of view, uh, with with the idea that that I have of of maybe creating three D objects that I want to use in my photographic composites, is that I could actually take the the photographic image where I'm placing the object and use that to essentially uh, create the, the the properly colored light. Is that how I'm reading that? Yep, that's exactly right. So if we take a look at this one here, that's how this scene was lit. I first built um, in compositing the landscape, the fog, the spikes coming out of the ground, the waterfall is all a composite. And then I saved that out as a JPEG image or a PSD file, brought in the 3D objects, composite them into the scene, finished it with the laser blast and so forth, then went back and grabbed the background that I saved out as a JPEG and used it to light the scene. So now that the 3D objects look like they're all part of the same lighting situation, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And that's that's really interesting, again, you know, in terms of, of the idea of combining a 3D object with an existing photograph. That just seems like such a, uh, a really useful... Uh, bit of functionality there yes and, cool. and adobe thought about it um pretty smart use if i go ahead and turn on the directional light now we're going to get much more harsher shadows falling on the ground plane and so forth very cool excellent demo that well you know that really um kind of whets my appetite in terms of <laughs> uh, going in and just exploring with some you know simple things i think what i'm going to probably do is do uh you know start off with some rudimentary cylinders to make towers with or pyramids or something but um it'll well, be enough to get my my feet let, wet let me share something with you real quick all right before we go we, we should have about five minutes you talked about rudimentary shapes all right so let's go over here let's create fill that with black okay and define that as a brush preset so that's my brush okay yep hit the b key there's my brush all right and let's go ahead while I'm thinking about it. Hit the V key, move this right about here. Hit the B key for the brush, and I'm going to turn off my selection. And how about we do something like this? I'm going to reduce the size. Let me go ahead and undo that. Reduce the size of my brush. Okay. And maybe bring it like this and maybe bring another one like, oops, like this, okay? And then maybe one more like that, and then like this. And what we're gonna do is 3D extrusions are there, create. And so this is one where we're gonna create our building and we're gonna extrude it like so, okay? And then we can map on our windows and so forth on this shape. Hmm. Okay. 
real fun stuff if you're utilizing your imagination. So, cool. So yeah, so hopefully this kind of helps um, you know, spark, spark the imagination a little bit. And when you start working with composites, you got to pay attention to your, um, your, your vanishing points, and um, uh, which, are, which is really establishing what the focal length of your lens is. So you start to create right. a composite. You want to create the composites according to a particular... So, so um, I have one final question on that, on that note yeah. um, before we exit out. And actually, you can, you can exit out of your screen share right now. You're back. Yes. <laughs> so and, and that's a, a wonderful 3D extrusion of you there that we're seeing. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you've done that. I know you've done that before. <laughs> but but anyway, so here's the question: As a compositing artist who wants to use photographs or 3D objects with my photographs, right. my photograph composites, right? Um, obviously, I, I I could basically look at what the focal length of the actual photograph that I'm using was and and type in that same fo uh, focal length into the 3d panel would that work well yes and no when we're working with compositing we're never working with just one image we're sure. working with a bunch of different images so and every image is not going to guarantee that you use the same lens you use the same um, position right. of the camera and so forth so so it's better to establish some type of a perspective from whether it's from one of your photographs or a custom perspective. And once it's established, then you can bring in your 3D object and tell the camera to match close to what that perspective would be, what the focal length of that lens would be. I see. So so will the uh, will, will, will Photoshop basically analyze the photograph where you're no. placing the object and, and try no. to match it? No. no. Okay. We're not we're not dealing with match moving technology, is what you're talking about. And right. that's a lot more money for that technology. Yeah, of course, of course, of course, <laughs> okay. of course. But you can fake it by, if you understand the concept of vanishing points and, and, and grids, sure. you can look that up on your own. And most, most, most users, you can look that up on your own. Establish that, and you can kind of figure out what focal length of the lens you should be using, and you should be okay. You'll, you'll, get, yeah. you'll get pretty close. Yeah, cool. Well, that is just excellent. Just totally cool. I'm, I'm really inspired now. I, I have a big project that I'm working on this weekend, but part of me is going to want to go and dabble in this. <laughs> Actually, to be truthful, I'm on my way to a, a company today to do a training, a half-day training on 3D and Photoshop. They make, they make products for, um, for, for, for watering gardens and so forth, and they want to get into creating 3D objects of their actual parts. And components so i'm yeah. going in to actually train them on how to do that in photoshop cool excellent well thank you so much for stopping by that was an great honor. and uh uh you know i think that maybe for a lot of photographers who are out there obviously this is sort of you know way out on the the extreme edges of what they might be interested in but for those people who are interested in uh compositing i think this is where this really uh, right. has some application with regular photography. And I think Adobe has challenged photographers because now they've taken Photoshop, or now they're offering the cloud for a very minimal price monthly, and now everybody gets all the programs, which means that now everybody's going to start experimenting with compositing, with 3D, with video, with, you know, yeah. uh, you know special effects in video. I mean, so it's uh, Adobe because of what they've done is changing the landscape in terms of how artists are going to think. So we all can't just think like a photographer anymore. We can't just think like a painter anymore. Yeah. We got to think multifaceted. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And, you know, uh, my uh, entry into uh, working with uh, video editing really started in Photoshop. Once I realized that, you know, I could edit video in Photoshop, that got me interested in, you know, creating cool video composites uh, and I, you know, that led to a lynda.com course on creative right. video compositing. And then that eventually led me into Adobe After Effects and Adobe yep. Premiere. So yep. that's one benefit of the, the whole creative cloud uh, mm. system that Adobe has. And working with 3D as well, you can, you can actually animate the 3D. You have limited animation capabilities of 3D options in Photoshop, which means you're going to start rendering them out into an AVI or an MPEG video and, and, and bring that into After Effects and do stuff in there. I mean, it's 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 gonna it's gonna change a lot of things. Yeah, 
Cool. Well, uh, great demo. Uh, I'm really inspired to try this out. <laughs> and um, Stephen, tell uh, people out there where they can find you on the web, your, your oh. main website. Yes, the main med, the main website, and I know that you're going to you know give it to everybody um, later on. But it's chromeillusion.com, www.chromeillusionnancy.com. All right, and you can you can view the books I've done, the videos, my fine art work there, and contact me personally there. Cool, and of course, then there's also that Facebook Photoshop users group, and we'll put all that in the show notes. And uh, since you have that book coming out uh, later this year, right? Yep, that's right. Um, the publisher is telling me about early December to, to hit the Christmas market. Oh, cool. So uh, hopefully uh, around that time, maybe you can come back again and we can I'll, explore some other I'll, stuff. And maybe I can show you some of my baby steps of stuff that I've been doing. <laughs> so you can get to start somewhere. I started. Yeah, well, too. I mean, come on. <laughs> everybody got to start somewhere. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much for stopping by, Stephen. I really appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me, Sean. This has, been a, this has been wonderful and an honor. Cool. And thank you for joining us on The Fix. Uh, hope you enjoyed uh, today's show and uh, found it useful and interesting. And uh, if you uh, explore and start making some 3D creations on your own, you know, let us know about it. And uh, let us know if you want to see more information of this sort. Make sure that you uh, subscribe to The Fix. You can go to thisweekinphoto.com slash The Fix and see all of our shows there. We've got lots of uh, great back catalog of cool episodes. And while you're at thisweekinphoto.com, make sure you check out all the other cool podcasts that are there. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks for watching. Go forth and pixelate.